Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to another lecture uh, in this class. Uh, we have a very exciting uh, guest lecture today. Um, so just sort of stepping back in this class, we have been studying everything in the umbrella of supervised learning so far. Um, we introduced, you know, sort of basic fundamentals of uh, multi-layer perceptrons of um, automatic differentiation, forward mode, reverse mode. And then we looked at a few different model classes, um, convolutional neural networks and uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, moving forward, we will be transitioning to other forms of supervision. Um, so in the future lectures, we're switching to a module on reinforcement learning. Um, today, we have a, a guest lecture on uh, self-supervised learning. Um, and what Ishan will be talking about is, uh, you know, weaker forms of supervision that you've, than you've seen in class. Um, now let me introduce uh, our, our speaker today. Um, Ishan is a, is a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Um, he got his uh, PhD um, at CMU uh, with uh, working with Marshall uh, Iber and Abhinav Gupta. Um, and he's been doing, his dissertation was also on learning from minimal supervision, but he's been really doing work at the cutting edge of uh, self-supervised low uh, levels of supervision, low short learning. Um, and some of the some of the techniques he've, he has developed uh, are now outperforming uh, supervised pre-training uh, for transfer tasks, which is uh, which has been a milestone that the computer vision community has had on its mind uh, for, I don't know, five, seven years at this point. Uh, since the AlexNet breakthrough, it was very clear that supervised pre-training had played an important role in a number of uh, uh, transfer tasks. Uh, clear that uh, trying to replicate that performance or outperform that performance um, with purely unsupervised or self-supervised tasks would be in uh, a very significant milestone. Um, so at this point, uh, in at this point today in computer vision, if you want to know about uh, self-supervised learning, there aren't too many other people more qualified than Ishan to talk about it. So we're very lucky, lucky to have him. All right, over to you, Ishan. Thank you, Dr. Um, hi everyone. So um, self-supervised learning, and specifically in the context of computer vision. Um, and self-supervised learning is basically sort of the preferred terminology for unsupervised learning. You can call it unsupervised, self-supervised. You can actually spend an entire lecture debating on what to call it, uh, but let's just stick with self-supervised for this one. So like uh, Dhruv mentioned, the success story of uh, supervision is really, really well known, right? So we take uh, in computer vision, you take images from ImageNet, you train a ConNet, basically to classify, say, a bunch of dog classes. Uh, and then you learn a representation. And it's not really about just solving ImageNet. So this, what has been really successful is that when you do this sort of learning on ImageNet, the pre-trained features that you get from this ConNet are very useful for downstream tasks. So we basically have a standard recipe. You pre-train on a large supervised data set. You can take ImageNet, you can take even larger data sets. And basically, you train a ConNet on these data sets, you learn a feature representation, and then you can transfer on any downstream tasks, say object detection, VQA, any of these tasks where you have a smaller amount of supervision. So if you have all of this, if you have such a great recipe that's working, why do we even care about any alternative form of supervision? So there are multiple arguments, and I'll just try to make one of the ones that I really care about. Uh, so getting real labels is very difficult and expensive. So ImageNet, which is like the full ImageNet data set with 14 million images, and it just has 22,000 labels, took 22 human years to get labeled entirely. And it just has basically fairly basic noun classes. It doesn't have a lot of verb classes. It doesn't even cover most of like the other noun classes that we care about, or not even adjective classes, phrases. And so just getting that sort of noun supervision has been like is actually fairly time consuming and just for 14 million images. On the other hand, if you look at say semi-automatic processes, for example, hashtags or GPS locations or the sort of kinds of supervision we'll talk about today, these are actually much more scalable. They're easy to obtain at a larger scale. So let's first start out with the thought experiment. Uh, can we get labels for all the data that we have? So in vision, if you take together all the sort of data sets, you combine them and you look at all the data sets that have bounding boxes, so where you know what kind of objects are present in the image and you have their location marked by a bounding box, you get about like a million images or so. So this is pretty good. But as you can imagine, drawing boxes is very cumbersome. It's really hard to do this. 
and for certain categories for example like sky or grass it's not even easy to draw a single box to tell you where all the sort of grass is present in the image so like the stuff categories so you can sort of relax this constraint and be like okay i only care about image level annotations so just tell me where uh, like what all concepts are present in the image i don't really care about where they are present and in this case of course this is much easier to annotate and so this gets us to imagenet where you get 14 million images this is pretty good but what about like on the internet what about the images there and so if you look at that this number is basically really 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 large and it's like i'm not i'm not like made an error in this plot basically you're not even able to see the bounding boxes or image level so if you just change this back to log scale you can basically see again um, what the sort of scale is what we're dealing with and if image net 14 million images takes 22 human years to label with like basically small amount of concepts it's really really hard for us to label either even internet photos or the real world with all sorts of complex labeling that we have so labeling just does not scale the size of data that we generate or even the complex concepts that we have the other problem with labeling is that most categories or the sort of way we observe them in the real world um, we have a zipfian sort of distribution where a lot of categories are really really rare so even if you keep sampling lots of data you're going to get very few examples of these rare categories so for example there was this like fairly famous data set called label me and in label me 10% of the classes really account for 93% of the data and that's because label me was sort of collected without uh, really caring about you know uh, ensuring that all of the classes have an equal rep representation it was really collected in the more um, in the wild manner what about different domains so what about places like medical imaging where getting labels is really difficult you can't really rely on just any person in the world to give you a label there are few experts who can actually give you labels for these kinds of images so this is sort of my or like a lot of people's motivation for using self supervised learning so what is self supervised learning the idea is that you can obtain labels from the data itself by using some kind of semi automatic process so in practice what a lot of people do is they have some kind of observed data so say the data in blue and then you have some hidden data or some hidden property of the data so for example say you observe um, a video and you only look at say frames till 10 seconds and then the point is that you want to predict what happens in the future in the video so that's sort of the hidden data so you set up this kind of a proxy problem where you of course know what the answer is or you know what the ground truth is so you can basically just use this semi automatic property to get more and more labels for free as the data comes in and just one sort of uh, uh thing on nomenclature self supervised learning uh, sort of the term the earliest reference i can find for it is from 94 from virginia desas thesis uh, and sort of she very clearly distinguished between unsupervised learning and self supervised learning uh where like for her the sort of term self supervised learning was more about looking at different modalities for example in this case she gives an example of uh, the sound a cow makes and the cow like the visual input uh, itself and sort of just correlating these multiple modalities so uh, if you look at in since 2015 i think since 2015 basically most people use self supervised and unsupervised rather interchangeably uh, all right so now that we know what or we have some kind of idea of what self supervised learning is let's look at some of the most basic or most successful examples of self supervised learning so the most successful example uh, has been word to vec uh, where which comes from nlp where the idea is that given a particular sentence you're essentially solving a fill in the blank task so you have this sentence the cat sits on the mat and what you can do is you basically uh, just ask this network to learn an embedding such that when it sees uh, the cat sits on the it's a, it it needs to pre uh, predict the next word which is mat in this case so the idea is that you're basically going to mask out or blank out certain words in the sentence and basically set up a prediction problem that the network is going to predict the missing word or what happens in the blank and this particular idea of predicting these masked words has been super successful in nlp so at this point like bert albert roberta all of these methods that really predict these masked entities are sort of the most state of the art models in nlp and they've been scaled uh, to like billions and trillions 
of data and parameters. So self-supervised learning is really useful um, and it helps us learn using observations and learns basically directly from the data itself because we do not need to exhaustively annotate concepts. It's really sort of very, very scalable to real world. And as I will show you later, it's very easy for us to leverage multiple modalities. So for example, if you want to learn from video and audio, or if you want to learn from some multiple other modalities, for example, say uh, vision and haptic touch in uh, robotics, you can sort of set up multiple self-supervised problems. So it's a very general concept. So now let's uh, talk about uh, self-supervised learning in the context of computer vision. The first thing that we uh, sort of introduce is this notion of a pretext task. So you can see that uh, computer vision, uh, especially for like this nomenclature was really inspired by NLP. So the idea is that you're going to solve this self-supervised task, which is say predicting the hidden data or predicting some hidden property of the data. And this task uh, is basically just useful for learning a representation. It's only a pre-training task. We don't really care about the particular task itself. All we care about is learning a useful representation so that we can transfer it to a downstream task where we have actual labels. So you don't care about the pretext task itself. And if you look at the nomenclature, it basically means that the downstream task is some task which is on text. And then this is a task that you're solving, which is pretext. So it was very much inspired by NLP. So these pretext tasks come in variety of formats. So people have set these up using images, video, video and sound. And there's been a lot of creativity uh, in sort of coming up with these pretext tasks. So up, like from 2015, this has sort of been the thing. Like every six months, people have been coming up with really, really creative pretext tasks. And all of them, like the performance basically keeps improving since then. So let's uh, look at a few examples of pretext tasks. So the first is going to be uh, about pretext tasks, which just use a single image. So the one of the most famous examples in this case is predicting the relative position of patches. So the idea is that you sample two patches. So these patches are sampled completely randomly and you treat one of them as sort of your base patch. And the idea is, so in this case, which is a blue patch. And the idea is that now whenever you sample a patch around this blue patch, you're going to ask the network to predict the relative location of the red patch, the second patch that you sampled with respect to the blue patch. And so if you predict this in a sort of grid like fashion, there are eight possible locations for a red patch. And so uh, this model works by basically feeding in the two patches uh, through a Siamese network. So essentially both the CNNs in this diagram share the same parameters, and then you get features for both these patches. Uh, you concatenate the features and then you just have a classifier that's going to predict a eight way class uh, like probability and just solve a eight way classification problem trying to predict basically where each of the patches lie. So you basically set up this problem. You take a bunch of images. Again, you don't need labels for them. You train a network to solve this relative position of a relative position problem. And the CNN hopefully learns a feature representation. And so now at test time, what you're going to do is you're going to throw away basically the classifier because you don't really care about predicting relative location. You're going to just take the CNN and then fine tune it on a downstream task, say like classifying dogs or classifying cats. And that downstream task, you basically have a lot of labels on or few labels on. So before we get into how these methods perform or like what sort of downstream tasks exist, Let's just first try to see what this particular task of predicting relative positions can teach us. So to do these, uh, the authors basically uh, feed forward a, a patch. So the patch that you see labeled as input on the leftmost side, you feed forward this patch through the network and then you extract feature representations for the patch. You do this for basically a lot of patches in the data set. And then you, uh, in this case, basically, just plot the nearest neighbors of the patches. So the idea is to basically see when this network learns a feature representation, what does it think are two related patches uh, by, you know, when you're either uh, solving this relative position task or whether you've pre-trained on ImageNet or basically whether you had a randomly initialized CNN. From the top row, we're looking at basically a part of a wheel of a bike. And you can see that the relative position patches are actually bikes uh, wheels. And 
if you look at the patches retrieved by a randomly initialized connet well they're basically all over the place it's getting say the mouse of a dog or it's getting a potted plant and if you look at the patches retrieved by an image net alex net uh, that again is going to be parts of wheels and this sort of uh, exists all over so you can see like in the second row or even in the last row where you're looking like a wheel of a car the relative positioning uh, m feature embedding is actually able to say that all the wheels of this car are sort of nearest neighbor and so it's able to retrieve them so this is one example of a pretext task and you can see that basically because this model needs to uh, I'll go back one slide because this model needs to say what patches occur in what location it learns some kind of co-occurrence of patches so it knows that okay if the patch blue patch that i sampled was on the nose of a cat and if another patch that i sample is say the ear of a cat it knows that these two patches need to be related why because the ear uh, generally happens to be on top of the uh, nose and so basically just by sort of solving these kinds of small tasks it's able to figure out what patches should uh, be together in a feature space okay so this one is basically just about relative position so another simple task and this one is so simple that um, and it works so well that most people like even now uh, i'm really astounded by the fact that this particular task works so this task you take an image and you can rotate it randomly you can rotate it either by 90 degrees 180 degrees 270 degrees or basically not rotate it at all and you feed in this image to a network and you ask it to solve a four way classification problem the network is supposed to predict which basically which rotation was applied to the input image so just solving like a four way classification problem and this particular task is really really powerful i mean it uh, outperforms like tasks like relative position and up until like maybe 2 3 years ago this was one of the sort of state of the art tasks um, <clears throat> in computer vision representation learning another simple task is basically uh, taking an image and basically dropping its color channel so just converting it into grayscale and then asking a network to predict its um, color so in this particular case why should the network learn something meaningful well because if it needs to color a fish um like or color a tree it needs to recognize that it's a tree in order to be able to color it as green or if it need if it wants to color sky then it needs to recognize what sky is in order to be able to color it as some shade of blue uh so these kinds of uh, pretext tasks were really sort of based on intuition uh, like no one can really tell you why a rotation task or why this colorization task works there's generally some kind of hand wavy intuition behind why a particular task will work and that's when i said that a lot of this pretext task designing was a lot of intuition and a lot of sort of hyper parameter search and really sort of figuring out what will make a network learn so now coming to the task uh, dhruv mentioned so this particular task is a direct translation of uh, word to vec into the image space so the idea is that you mask out a particular part of the image and then you ask a network to predict what is you know like what is the uh, what are the pixels basically in that masked out part so uh, this is a fairly complicated task to set up because you're essentially trying to generate things right so you have this high dimensional space in which you're going to predict each pixel value and at that particular time when this came out gans were still sort of fairly new we did not know a lot of tricks on how to train them so these kind of context based auto encoders or context based gans were not as powerful um, but i think since then we've progressed a lot and you can see that these kind of generative models which are like trying to figure out like masked uh, thing like masked uh, properties or like uh, generate images themselves to learn the representations these have come a really long way since 2016 and now we actually see a lot of um, performance improvement on these things so the next thing i'll talk about is using self supervised learning for video so uh, now let's talk about self supervised learning in the context of video so uh, one of the sort of works i'll talk about most of the uh, work in sort of video really tries to use this notion that video can be viewed as a sequence of frames so you essentially have like if you think about nlp where you have words in a particular sequence a video is basically frames in a particular sequence so you can set up multiple tasks you can try to predict the order of the frames you can try to do fill in the blanks you can track objects and basically each of these ideas sort of gives rise to all these different kinds of pretext tasks so i won't enumerate all of them i'll just like uh, touch upon a few of these so 
one of the ones that we worked on back in the day was trying to predict uh, basically given a video frame you extract three frames from the video and you basically just keep them in the right order and that gets a positive label and then you take three frames and you shuffle them and that gets basically a negative label so the idea is basically that now from this video i can generate for free lots of these positive and negative tuples so i can generate basically these three uh, uh, frame tuples by shuffling them and assign them a negative label and then uh, the, the correct one basically gets a positive label and my network is basically trained to predict whether uh, the tuple is shuffled or not and so again why should this particular task even work so if you think about it what this task is really trying to do is if you have this sort of space of or manifold of images then it's really trying to ask the question given a start point and an end point can a particular frame lie in between so if if i were to sort of erase the frame in blue and just look at the first and the third frame if you just give you that much of context then i'm basically trying to ask you can you fill in the blank and can you tell me basically whether the frame in blue is even a plausible sort of uh, action in between and of course we are not really trying to generate pixels here we are just uh, solving a binary verification problem whether this particular uh, tuple is shuffled or whether it's not so the problem setup is very straightforward uh, architecture is very straightforward you take like three frames you feed them to a siamese network just like we did with the patches in the relative position task you concatenate the features of each of these three frames and then you just have a binary classification layer which just predicts whether this uh, uh, like <clears throat> whether the tuple is shuffled or not so just a binary label you get a cross entropy loss you can basically back propagate and train all the layers of your network and then you basically chop off the concatenation of the classification layer and just use that remainder network for your feature uh, like for your downstream tasks so like we did with the relative position uh, representation let's just do the same exact thing and try to see what this network learns so i have a query frame i'm going to extract features from the query frame using either a imagenet pretrained network or a shuffle and learn network or a random network and then i'm going to look at nearest neighbors of these uh like of the um, in basically my training set so what you can see is in the first column and the imagenet supervised network really picks up on the semantic class so uh, the query frame in the first row is basically uh, someone inside a gym and imagenet is immediately able to pick out that this is a person in a gym the shuffle and learn network it's not rather clear what's happening the random network probably is picking up on the color in the second row you basically see the same thing where uh the imagenet model is really able to figure out that this is an outdoor sort of sports scene and it's immediately able to pick out that particular uh something from that re related semantic category the shuffle and learn model it's not super clear and the random network seems to focus mainly on the green color now so when we got this result we were really surprised we probably thought that this network is not doing a lot but then carefully looking at these images we figured out that basically what the network was looking at was the pose of the person So in the top row you can see that the query frame has a person who is upside down and the shuffle and learn retrieve frame is also a person who is upside down and in the second row it's basically a person who is throwing a ball and uh, the shuffle and learn network is also sort of uh, picked on a person who is sort of moving their hands so does anyone have any idea why this would happen uh, why would so sort of solving this particular task get such kind of features for the right reason so it's basically because when if you have to predict whether three frames are in order you need to focus on the object in the uh, video that is moving and in this case all of the videos we trained on were of people moving so it really needs to figure out what is moving and it does not need to look at the background so in the gym scene if the network basically learns feature representations that are looking at the full uh, scene it will never be able to figure out what is the right order because three frames that are coming from that video which are nearby to each other all sort of share the same background the only thing that's really moving in them is the person so essentially then feature representation really needs to focus on the person and not the background so to sort of verify this what we did is uh to, we took this network and tried to fine tune it on this task of uh, human uh, pose estimation or human key point estimation so in this task uh, what we do is we basically try to predict certain key points on the human body so the elbows the wrists the neck um so, so like uh in the torso and you basically have these key points and you're trying to predict uh predict where they are in like high accuracy 
So what we did is we first took an ImageNet supervised model and then we fine-tuned it on these two data sets, Flick and MPII. AUC sort of a metric to figure out how accurate you are, so higher is better. And the ImageNet supervised model was sort of the standard on this task. People would take an ImageNet supervised model and fine-tune it on the pose estimation task. So the shuffle and learn model actually gave fairly competitive performance. So on, in fact, on one data set, it actually was slightly better than an ImageNet supervised model. Uh, whereas on other downstream tasks, like say, if you looked at action recognition, or if you looked at other semantic classification tasks, the shuffle and learn model was really not good. But in some particular cases, it was starting to show some kind of promise over ImageNet supervised models. And this is again, really based on getting lucky, right? So you need to figure out a good pretext task you need to cross your fingers and hope that the network learns good feature representations on that pretext task. And then you need to figure out a good downstream task to sort of capture your intuition uh, after you stare at multiple of these nearest neighbor images uh, and then basically find a good downstream task and then show that that model actually improves there. And there are like multiple other sort of more powerful models based on this same idea where you can rather than look at single frames, you can actually look at entire clips. Uh, so and you basically uh, like are able to reason about longer term temporal uh, information rather than just a single frame. So now we just try to look at one example of using video and sound. And this is just to sort of show you how general self-supervised learning is. Uh, and it can very easily ingest like multiple modalities. So this particular work uh, titled Objects That Sound, uh, the authors really wanted to train a single network that would predict if an image and an audio clip correspond. So essentially, if you have a person playing a guitar and you have the sound from that particular video, what you can do is you can set up a fairly simple binary prediction problem. You can take a video that is of a person playing a drum and you can have its corresponding soundtrack and you can basically uh, take the video and the audio and this becomes a positive tuple. Another thing you can do is you can take the video of a person playing a guitar, but at this time you will take the audio from the from another video, say of someone playing a drum. And now this audio and video pair become a negative. So the authors basically have a twin network. Uh, one is an image network, one is an audio network, and you feed in the frame basically uh, from your video. You feed in the audio either from that particular video or from a different video, and then you're just solving a binary classification problem again. So just predicting yes or no. So well, this model is fairly straightforward. You feed forward that uh, image, you get a visual embedding, you feed forward the audio, you get an audio embedding, and then you just have a fully connected layer on top that is going to predict a like two values, uh, basically yes or no. So what this sort of model uh, showed, uh, and which was quite surprising at the time, is that audio actually is a very good way to learn visual representations. And these authors could also show that you can now basically uh, retrieve uh, things like if I show you the picture of a person playing a guitar, this model could know, uh, could sort of retrieve together the audio of what that particular guitar would sound like. It, in fact, it could do things like distinguish between an electric guitar and an acoustic guitar because it actually knew all of these sort of small things. And sort of another fun part of it was that it could actually, uh, again, like Dhruv had mentioned earlier, it, uh, if you look at what is making the sound, this model can localize together like the pixels in the particular image that are making a sound. So for example, in this particular image, you have two instruments, you have a piano and a person playing a flute. So what this model knew is that basically, if you look at the saliency map, it has a very strong sort of peaks on the, uh, the flute and the piano. So it could automatically pick out uh, sort of uh, objects in the video that would actually make sound. And this requires no sort of video or motion information. It's just by looking at this still image. So the next thing we are going to look at is basically what are what do these pretext tasks learn? And at some point, someone asked me, like, are these pretext tasks even complementary? So in 2017, there was this really nice study about taking, say, the relative position task and the colorization task and then basically taking a network that can do both of these tasks together, so a multitask network. Uh, and you can see that basically combining together these tasks actually improves performance significantly. So either on the detection task or on image net, this actually does pretty well. And you can, and this paper basically went on to combine like four or five of these tasks and actually show that by adding each one of them, you could still gain performance. But 
the effect was really saturating after a point basically like after you add maybe like three or four tasks the marginal gain that you get after sort of adding the fifth or the sixth tasks that we very very limited and so why would this be the case and so to do this we what we need to do is we first need to understand what do these pretext tasks do and what is sort of a maybe a, uh, a problem in how they are set up so if you think about it in terms of the information that is predicted in each of these tasks it's very clear that uh, certain pretext tasks are actually predicting more information and certain pretext tasks are actually predicting very little information for example just look at the patch uh, like the example i started with so if you have eight possible locations of a patch what you're doing is you're predicting just a uh, eight way you're solving a eight way classification problem whereas if you're trying to predict the pixels of what is missing in an image you're actually predicting the sort of entire pixels in a square patch so you're actually predicting far more information than you are in the case of just these eight pixels so intuitively it kind of makes sense right if you predict more information you should learn something more um, you should sort if you have sort of a harder pretext task if you have a harder proxy task the network should learn something which is far more generalizable or it should learn far better features than if you predict less information and so this sort of insight is what has driven i would say most of the self supervised work uh, since 2017 onwards so i can roughly categorize it into sort of three buckets so pretext tasks which were basically about solving the sort of proxy task that you set up contrast over clustering based methods and then generative methods and on the bottom i'm showing you an arrow basically that when you move from left to right you're actually predicting more information so pretext tasks predict less information contrastive clustering actually predict more and then generative models like auto encoders gans vaes that actually predict far more information for the sort of scope of this lecture i'm going to just focus on the first two uh, pretext and contrastive uh, and not on the generative part and i can just uh, add a quick comment here a logistical note that we will cover vaes and gans towards the end of the semester go ahead ashwin so one thing that we wanted to study in 2018 and 19 was basically what is the limit of these um, self supervised models so there's another sort of fairly famous uh, pretext task called jigsaw puzzles the idea in this case is you take an image and you chop it up into nine pieces and then you just basically just permute the pieces and you feed these uh, patches or these pieces into a network so each patch basically goes through a network independently you concatenate the features of each of these patches and to predict what was the like permutation applied to the input patch so the idea is that you are basically solving a jigsaw puzzle uh, you can think of this as a more sort of general way rather than just predicting the relative position of patches this is looking at like all nine patches at once so this task had become fairly popular uh, it was introduced in 2016 and a lot of people had been using it so what we wanted to do was basically study the limit of this task so we took this jigsaw puzzle task and we scaled it up and we basically trained this task on 100 million images and our goal was basically to see that if we give it enough data can this task really outperform imagenet supervised training because up until then uh, a lot of the sort of hypothesis was that the reason self supervised learning has not really shown like you know a lot of great progress is because we haven't scaled it to the right amount of data because we are predicting very small amount of information per image we really need lots of images to learn something more meaningful so we did that we basically trained uh, this jigsaw model on 100 million images and then the next thing we did was basically we evaluate this network by looking at different layers and extracting the features from these different layers so in this particular setup what we'll do is we'll take a network we'll evaluate uh, we'll feed forward an image and we'll extract the feature from each layer of the network and then on top of these fixed features we'll train a linear classifier uh, to solve that particular downstream task so for example in this case we are looking at voc classification so in voc you have 20 classes and you're basically just trying to predict uh, whether an image contains you know which of which of these 20 classes and so you just train a linear classifier in this case a linear svm on these fixed features so uh the one thing that we observed is that um uh, and which is consistent with the information prediction hypothesis is that if you take uh, any model so in, in this case say alexnet or resnet and on the x axis i am basically showing you the number of permutations i am predicting in the model so 
if you have nine patches, the total is nine, nine factorial, which is like 360,000. Of course, we can't like predict all of them. So we just uh, pick like a small set. So either predict 100 permutations or only 700 or up till 10,000. And what we observed is basically for a large model like a ResNet 50, uh, the uh, performance basically keeps improving as you predict more and more information. And this was true. And basically up until this study, uh, people had basically predicted up to 2000 permutations with, uh, uh, with the ResNet 50 or even AlexNet. And if you stop the curve at 2000, it looks like this is basically going to keep growing all the way. But what happens is basically it grows up until 5000, but you can see that the gain is very minimal. And then basically starting at about 10,000, the gain is almost negligible, or in fact, there is a small drop in performance. So this was sort of an eye-opening thing for us because what we figured out is if, even if you keep sort of increasing the amount of information uh, that you're predicting in these pretext tasks, you're still not going to like get a lot of uh, performance gain on the downstream task. So there is something else that is actually missing from these tasks. It's not just about information gain or information prediction. So there was one positive result, which is that on certain tasks, like uh, predicting 3D, so in this case, you take an image and you try to predict uh, the 3D structure uh, of the scene around that uh, image. So the 3D structure in this case is the surface normal, which is the X, Y, and Z sort of uh, normal that is coming out of each pixel. And for this particular case, a model trained with Jigsaw on 100 million images could handily outperform an ImageNet supervised model on like multiple metrics. So this was still a good a good sort of uh, conclusion, but it showed that there is something really missing from pretext tasks. So next we'll try to figure out what this sort of, uh, what is missing from these pretext tasks. So I'll go ahead. So to do this, let's consider two sort of different uh, pretext tasks, rotation and jigsaw puzzles. So rotation, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you take an image and you try to predict what was the rotation applied to it. In jigsaw puzzles, you take patches from an image and then you're trying to basically put together these patches once more. So when you do these sort of pretext tasks, there is really a very, very big underlying assumption. That underlying assumption is actually a hope. It is the hope of generalization. So we do this pre-training and we wish really, really hard that the pre-training task and the transfer task are aligned. And there's no real reason why this should happen. And a lot of it is based on trial and error. In fact, if you ask someone, why should solving jigsaw puzzles teach you about semantics? Why should it teach you about what a cat is or what a dog is? It's not really clear why this should happen. In fact, in general, it is not clear why performing a non-semantic task, like predicting a rotation or predicting something like the arrangement of patches, why should such a task even produce good features? So to sort of uh, investigate this further, what we can do is we can take a pre-trained network. So in this case, again, a jigsaw model. And then we can look at uh, each of the layers and how these layers perform. And so maybe this can sort of tell us if there is something funny going on in the network. So again, I'll basically uh, keep the network fixed. I'll just extract, uh, use it as a feature extractor, and then I'll train a linear classifier on top of it. So we did this basically for a ResNet 50 model that we had trained using jigsaw. And this was a ResNet 50 of it. So you basically have say five major uh, stages from it. So con one to res five. And you train linear classifier on the features extracted from each of these stages. So res five is basically the uh, feature that is closest to the output. Res four and res three and con one. So in this case, a sort of funny thing happens. You see that the performance from con one to res two is actually good. Now res two to res three is pretty good. Res three to res four is pretty good there's a dramatic decrease in performance when you're going from res4 to res5. Whereas if I were to repeat the same sort of exercise for a supervised model, the performance just continues to keep going up. So it goes up from res4 to res5. And so this observation is consistent across different uh, methods. So we repeated the same thing for rotation, colorization, a lot of these pretext tasks, relative position. And what we found is that the higher layers of these models really don't generalize. So one thing that basically, um, can happen and why this might be the case is because what we are solving, the pretext task has nothing to do with our downstream task. So solving a jigsaw puzzle has nothing to do with classifying an image into 20 classes. So what ends up happening is that at the last layer, the res five layer in this case, the features become very, very specific to the jigsaw task. And that's why they don't very generalize very well to a downstream task like image classification. 
So this is still like very much like conjecture. Is there any sort of simpler way to understand whether this actually happens? So, yes. Uh -huh. So you're about to launch into an interesting bit, but uh, just so we make sure everybody's on the same page, can you say a bit more about uh, uh, what does it mean to train a linear classifier on these fixed features? Can you just describe that process uh, a bit more? Yeah. So the linear classification uh, process, or a lot of people call it linear probe, it's basically to understand what the feature of the network is. So there are two ways to basically evaluate a network, right? So one is to uh, do your pre-training and then fine tune the network on a downstream task. So when you when I say fine tune, what I mean is you're going to update all of the weights of the connet with back propagation. So basically the entire network basically gets updated on your downstream task. Now, so this is one way of doing it. But what happens in this particular way is that you're updating all of the weights by back propagation. So if you had, if you like basically fine tune for very long, you can destroy the information that you had learned during pre-training. So in some way, it doesn't really tell you a lot about what, what did you learn during pre-training itself. The second way of doing it is to keep the network itself frozen. So you do not update the weights of the connet. All you're going to do is just going to use it as a fixed feature extractor. So you feed in an image to the connet, and then after you basically apply your convolution operation, you'll get an activation map. And you'll get multiple activation maps at different stages of the connet. And you're just going to use this activation map, and you're going to apply a fully connected layer uh, or a linear layer on top of it. And then you're, when you're back propagating, you will not back propagate to the connet, you'll only back propagate up till the fully connected layer. So in a sense, what you're doing is you're trying to figure out how good are these features if I were to just train a limited number of parameters, if I were to just train a simple linear layer on this. And what this tells us is basically, if these features are good enough for you know, a semantic class or a semantic classification task, and it helps us isolate sort of the problem of just studying the pretext task rather than the, uh, when you fine tune, you're basically sort of mixing together information from the labels into the weights of the network. So linear sort of classifier, or it's also called linear probing, where you sort of attach these linear probes at different layers of ComNet really helps us study the pre-trained features in isolation. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so yeah, basically the analysis of the linear probing was that at res five, there is something funny that is happening and the network is not really generalizing uh, to the downstream tasks. So one of the hypotheses in our work was basically that what we should be doing is basically completely uh, we should not be predicting pretext tasks. We should in fact be learning something that is in there into pretext task. So what do I mean by that? So in a pretext task, you take an image, you apply an image transform T, and then you basically take a continent that is going to take the transformed image and predict its property. So as an example, imagine that T is basically chopping up the uh, image into jigsaw tiles. So you feed all of these patches you know, into the network, and then, then you're predicting basically a property of the transform T, which is basically how were the patches shuffled. Another example is T can basically be rotating an image. So you rotate an image randomly, and now you're predicting a property of what was the rotation applied to the image. So this is sort of a general pretext task. If you look at what's happening over here is you feed in the image through a con net, uh, and the last layer basically that's performing this prediction task Kaden needs to produce features that contain information about the transform T. So as my transform T varies, the features at the last layer actually also have to vary or at least need to vary in a particular way to capture some property about this transform. So if my image rotates, the features at the last layer or the activation produced at the last layer also need to capture some information about the rotation that happened at the like the input layer of the continent. So this I uh, sort of we felt that this was sort of the reason that the network uh, learns less semantic features. So let's just sort of recap this out. In pretext tasks, you basically apply a known image transform T to the image. You construct this task to predict the property T from the input image, right? Uh, so most of the pretext tasks like colorization, rotation, jigsaw, relative prediction, all of them can be sort of encapsulated in this formulation of pretext task. It's all about predicting property of the transform T. Now, if you look at, uh, I don't know if you've uh, covered like classic uh, features like SIFT or HOG, I'm not sure. Uh, 
these sort of hand designed features in computer vision uh, like sift and hog are possibly the most famous examples they were designed to be invariant to low level data transforms for example sift actually stands like i and sift is actually for invariance and if you look at even the modern deep learning systems you apply data augmentation so you say rotate the image or you sort of flip the image but you want the network's output to be unchanged right you want the network to still be able to recognize that it's a dog you want its prediction to be constant no matter what is happening at the input so in some way no matter what happens at the input you want the last layer feature to be invariant to it whereas in a pretext task you're doing something completely opposite you're feeding in a, a, a sub you're applying a data transform to the input image and then you're really asking the last layer feature to vary as the input uh, transform so it's something completely opposite so in this work we did something fairly simple uh, we basically set up a pretext task but we didn't want to solve the pretext task uh, what we were trying to do is we were trying to learn the representations that are invariant to the pretext task you take an input image i you take the input image it which basically is a transformed version you get two representations from it and you're basically going to try to encourage these representations to be similar so the idea is that by doing so the representation will contain no information about the transformed t and hopefully if our hypothesis is correct this sort of invariance will make our features more generalizable because now no matter the input sort of perturbation that is applied to the input my feature is going to be more stable or more constant and to do this a uh, quick question here ishan uh, aren't we setting up a uh, uh, a conflicting target so you can get representations that are very similar that contain no information about the transformations so let's say these representations were identical then your performance on the pretext task would be you know chance or or 0% or depending on how it's set up um but uh, if pretext tasks are useful for learning representations because you didn't do well on the pretext task at all you don't end up learning useful representations um so we we're, we're sort of we're hoping for the middle ground you know you don't want to do too well on the pretest task but you don't want to do too poorly on it either is that an yes. accurate yes so uh somewhat more than that so uh, on a pretext task initially there was a lot of like uh, that's actually one of the reasons i showed the like number of permutations uh, thing on jigsaw so there was a very high correlation in the pretext task accuracy and the downstream performance but there is a breaking point there is a point where basically you can be very very good on your pretext task and actually hurts your downstream performance and so in this particular case uh, we decided that basically pretext tasks are actually not even doing the right thing we don't believe that you know solving jigsaw is actually even the right thing so what we want to do is we just want to treat jigsaw as a kind of data augmentation so you can think of i and it as basically being two data augmented copies of each other where the data augmentation is being given to you by the pretext task and all you are doing is that your representation needs to be invariant against the, uh, under this data transformation so the idea is not to even solve the pretext task at all we are actually we don't want to solve it because we think that solving the pretext task is actually the wrong thing to do okay i agree i think more and more uh, yeah more and more it's basically becoming clear that a lot of it is about data augmentation and towards the end if i get time i'll sort of try to draw that connection okay so uh coming to, coming back to the slide uh so perl which stands for pretext invariant representation learning is trying to learn these representations which are going to be similar and to do this we are going to use something called contrastive learning. all right so contrastive learning is like far more general than self supervised learning it's basically sort of a learning objective something like cross entropy uh and the idea over here is that you want to learn you basically start with a group of related and unrelated images so the images in each row are related so the green images are related the purple images are related the blue images are related what you do is you basically extract feature uh, representations for each of the items that you have um, and you get embeddings for each one of them and your loss function is basically about bringing together the representations from the related images and spreading away the representations from unrelated images so what you want is you want the embeddings for the blue items to be very close to each other and the distance between these embeddings to be smaller than the distance between the embedding for a blue item and a green item or a blue item and a purple item so this is sort of a very uh, picturesque or graphical interpretation of a loss of the contrastive loss function 
the idea is basically about pulling together things that are related and pushing away things that are unrelated. So if you think about it, uh, like in sort of terminology, the related items are basically kind of your positives. You basically want all of these things to be uh, close together and all the unrelated items are negatives. And good negatives are very, very important in contrastive learning. And why would that be the case? If you do not have any negatives at all, there's a very simple solution. You can map all the items or all the images to a single representation, to a fixed representation, right? So your network is basically say all zeros and it maps all the images to a vector, which is all zeros. So in this case, uh, all my, no matter the input, my representation is going to be closed. Basically all the blue items and all the green items are going to be closed. But when I add this term on the right hand side, where I'm trying to say that all the negative items should be far away, then I can never produce a Z, like a constant representation. So this basically prevents some kind of collapse in the representation. Another way to interpret this is that basically in my feature space, what I'm doing is I'm basically trying to, again, pull together my related items, pull together my positive sample and spread away the negative samples. So this is contrastive learning. This has been known like for a very long time and it's used basically in like face, face recognition, uh, in recommendation systems and so on. But how does this relate to pretext task? So, uh, when basically I said that we want our sort of uh, uh, representations to be similar, no matter the transform applied at the input image, uh, contrastive learning is a way to sort of achieve this goal. So in Perl, what we do is we basically take an input image I, we take the input image IT, and we obtain two feature representations from basically these two images. So the patches uh, from the image or the whole image, and then we want the feature representations F and G to be similar. Whereas we can obtain a feature representation from another image, uh, which is a different image in the data set. And we call this an unrelated image. And basically this um, sets up a contrasted learning problem where the image and the patches from the image are basically positives. So they, they sh the features from them should be close by and the features from any other image in the data set are unrelated and they should be spread away. So uh, basically in Perl, we use this contrastive learning framework and that sort of helps us get this pretext invariant property. So when you learn a network this way, uh, we can basically repeat the same linear probing experiment that you train linear classifiers on the fixed network. So in green is basically the jigsaw model that I'd shown you earlier. And in pink is basically the Perl model. And you can see that as the sort of uh, network depth increase, as you basically go deeper into the network, uh, as we saw earlier with the jigsaw model, the performance drops a lot from res four to res five. Whereas for the Perl model, the performance keeps increasing from res four to res five. So what this sort of suggests is that at res five, you're learning feature representations that transfer very well to a downstream task. In this case, ImageNet classification. Whereas in jigsaw, that is still not happening. And so maybe learning features that are invariant to the data transforms is probably more important or more useful for downstream classification tasks. Another sort of thing that uh, happened with Perl is we were able to show that uh, this sort of Perl pre-training can outperform ImageNet supervised pre-training on, on the task of object detection. So this was generally considered like a big milestone because um, doing this is fairly challenging and ImageNet pre-training is very, very well optimized for like downstream tasks like VOC object classification or object detection. And in this case, we could see fairly consistent gains over uh, like the ImageNet supervised network. Ishan? The other thing is uh, at the time, you can see that uh, all the models which are basically below 50% on this uh, graph, except CPC, all of them are doing some kind of pretext task. And all the models which are above are either doing something which is contrastive or which is something which is generative. You can see that there's sort of starting to become a clear divide between the contrastive methods performance and the performance of the pretext tasks. So I sort of uh, this again suggests that maybe doing like solving the pretext task by itself is probably not the right thing. Thanks. So uh, I don't think I'm going to get through all my slides. Uh, so I just try to finish at a good point. Um, so in Perl, you can basically also easily multitask like, and you can basically use like multiple transforms. It just doesn't have to be one pretext task because essentially you're treating them as data augmentation. So you can just do all of them, one of them, none of them. And in general, contrastive learning basically has become super, super popular these days. So 
most of the self-supervised methods are really using that. And why is this the case? Because contrasted weathering is super simple to set up. All you need to do is define what images or what items are related and what items are unrelated. So if you were to do this, uh, you can basically look at a video and you can say that frames that are nearby to each other are related to each other and frames that are far away are not related or frames from a different video are not related. And that basically gives, and if you set up a contrasted learning setup on this, you can get basically something like CPC. You can do the same thing for video and audio rather than setting up a binary verification problem. You're going to set up a contrastive learning problem that is going to basically pull together the embeddings from a video and its corresponding audio and push away the embeddings from a video and unrelated audio. Same thing you can apply basically for something like tracking. So you can basically track an object through images uh, through a video. And then basically you can just say that patches that come which were tracked together should be close by, whereas patches basically which are not tracked should be far away. And on and on. Basically, you can keep doing this within an image. You get like various versions like contrastive predictive coding. You can do it for patches uh, of an image versus patches from a different image. That gives you stuff like MoCo, SimCLR. And basically, this has become fairly universal now at this point. And uh, yeah, they have sort of eclipsed pretext tasks. Okay, so all of this has been really great. I mean, basically in 2020, if you're doing anything apart from contrastive learning, most people will ask you the question, why? Why are you doing anything apart from contrastive learning for self-supervised learning? So at this point, of course, if someone says that, it's the right time to ask the question, well, is contrastive learning even really important? So going back to the picture, what does contrastive learning do? Contrastive learning basically says that positive samples should be pulled close and negative samples should be pushed away. And so in this case, you have the blue samples being pulled together and the green and the purple ones being uh, pushed away. You can repeat the same thing. You can basically say that now my purple examples are close by, so these should be pulled together and the other samples should be pushed away. So essentially, contrastive learning is trying to create groups in the feature space. It's basically trying to say that the blue items are related, they form a particular group. The green items are related, they form a particular group. And the purple items are related and they form a particular group. So we know of lots of ways of doing this. The contrastive learning is just one particular way of achieving this goal. Another simple way of achieving this is actually clustering. So you can basically try to create these groups in feature space by trying to do clustering rather than doing contrastive learning. So uh, at this paper, uh, SWAV, which will actually appear at NeurIPS this year, we basically showed that uh, you can achieve the same sort of feature representation learning by doing clustering rather than contrastive learning. And in fact, by doing clustering, you actually get certain uh, like uh, more benefits to this rather than contrastive learning. For example, these models actually converge much faster. So I don't have a lot of time to go into it, but the uh, sort of key idea is that you have a data set, which is all your samples. And what you do is you maintain prototypes, which can be thought of as cluster heads. So at each sort of training iteration, what you're trying to do is you're trying to establish uh, whether a data point, uh, which sort of clusters it belongs to. And uh, so basically the entire point is that the clusters and the uh, feature representation are learned online. And so you're basically performing online clustering as you're sort of classifying your, uh, as you're basically classifying your data. I'm going to skip these slides. Uh, basically the point is that this model is not contrastive and it can actually achieve results which are better than contrastive methods uh, so far. So like on the second line, you have results from MoCo v2. On the last line, you have SWAV. And basically, it can converge faster than models which are uh, doing something like contrastive learning. So, and it's 100% student friendly because you can actually train it on just four to eight GPUs within 100 hours. Uh, I, I, like I like that stamp. <laughs> Yeah, this was this was fairly important to us because like other models, really, it takes a very, very long time. OK, OK. There, are, there is still a section later, but I, I like if anyone's interested, they can read about it and reach out to me offline. Sounds good. Um, so we'll we won't uh, introduce new material beyond this point, but we will continue to take questions. So feel free to post them uh, in the Q&A 